So what are you putting out there? And we, it's really interesting. If I speak at a conference, I will often select people that I know are in that industry and I will go to their blog articles. I will go to their LinkedIn articles and I'll pull real world titles that they're using. 99% of the content that small business owners put out who are trying to operate in the B2B space are putting out messaging to the doer, to the doer level of how, how do you get, let's say you're a leadership coach, how do you give feedback in an interview or, or to uh, an employee who's not do, performing well? How would you give feedback to that employee? Well, that's doer level messaging. But you want them to buy a strategic solution, ideally a 12-month leadership development program to you. So what you should be talking to decision makers about is decision maker level topics, which is what kind of components should you be including in your 12-month leadership development course, you know, programs and journeys, not how do you give feedback? How do you... Welcome to another episode of Creating Powerful Impact. I'm your host, Shay Wheat, founder of Grace and Ease Productions, where we help and support entrepreneurs just like you to profitably scale your business with events, allowing you to make sales faster with greater predictability and less team burnout. Today, I'm really excited because our guest is a freaking powerhouse. Like she is the leader of Bold House. And that is the one and only Angelique Ruers. Like I said, the CEO of Bold House, an Inc. 5000 recognized company and advocate for helping small entrepreneurs, enterprises, and self-employed professionals win and work with corporate clients. She's been called the undisputed champion at helping small businesses land big clients by Inc. Magazine. They have also been mentoring 14,000 plus entrepreneurs in 72 plus countries. This woman is amazing. She's got expertise and has been featured by Forbes, Entrepreneur, Inc., ABC, NBC, CBS, Insider, just everybody and more. So help me welcome Angelique to the Creating Powerful Impact stage. How are you? I am so excited for this conversation because I love events and I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. I'm super stoked to have you here. Now, we've been in each other's world for a number of years. We've danced in a few of the same circles. And Indeed. <laughs> like it, we were just saying before we started pressing record, it's like, when we're doing and we see each other at events or we're doing events, you're on my client stages or vice versa. It's like, we don't really have a chance to like talk, talk. Never. And so <laughs> I'm so stoked that we actually get to talk, talk here. And for those that don't really know about you and your company and how, how you're out there creating impact, I would love for you to share, like, why are you so passionate about helping the small business, quote unquote, Davids of the world to take on working with those big corporate Goliaths out there? Oh my God, I love that question. So, you know, I spent the first 10 years of my career working in the Fortune 100. And I was so fortunate because literally from day one, I was working not just steps from the CEO's office, but with him and other C-suite executives daily. And so for 10 years, I was sitting in the boardroom. I had millions of dollars that would be spent on services and expertise. I wasn't in purchasing. I was leading initiatives around things like change in the organization involved with things like IPOs and mergers and acquisitions and financial communications and just change efforts inside these organizations. And I sat through hundreds and hundreds. At one point, I, I started calculating it with something like 2,000 to 3,000 sales meetings, sales calls, vendor suppliers, but hundreds of final negotiations, actually hiring hundreds and hundreds of outside experts and service providers. And again, not through the lens of those people in procurement and purchasing who are worrying about paper clips. You know, this was true strategic purchasing. And after a decade, I left and I started my own consulting firm. And at this point, all I know is corporate. All I know is the Fortune 500. And so that's who I go after with my consulting business. And I loved it. I just knew when I started that business, Shay, that I needed to not show up and not market or sell to decision makers 
the way that for the last 10 years, people have been trying to sell to me. I hated it. I absolutely hated it. And it made me sick to my stomach to think that I would go back to my former coworkers or people who were now sitting on the other side of the table where I had been sitting. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to show up to those meetings the way that people had showed up with me, which was always underserving me. It was always, you know, from their perspective, their needs. I hated it. Mm -hmm. So the first thing was when I start my consulting business, I'm going to show up the way I wish that outside coaches, consultants, speakers, trainers, service providers, copywriters, graphic designers, PR firms, muralists, graphic, you know, uh, interior designers, um, stylists, photographers, you name it, I hired it. And I, I showed up differently and it worked. It really worked. It was comfortable. I didn't have to feel salesy. I didn't have to feel like I was selling my soul to, you know, the devil here. And it worked. And I created these unbelievable corporate client relationships. And I got to do all these amazing things. Lo and behold, um, I end up in a mastermind program in what I now call the online marketing fishbowl. <laughs> yep. And the first mistake I made was starting to think that I needed to do things the way that that world was doing them. But more importantly, I was watching people in these mastermind groups that I found myself in being told by coaches that they could take the exact same strategies that they were using for speak to sell, enrollment events, um, online courses, uh, challenges, you name it. Back when we had instant teleseminar, because I'm going way back. <laughs> yeah. And you know what I'm talking about, right? And I'm watching these coaches tell who've never sold a thing to corporate, who've never been a decision maker in corporate. And I'm watching them tell these folks, oh, you can use these same strategies with B2B and corporate decision makers. And I was losing my mind. I was absolutely losing my mind. So I ended up getting asked by people that saw me at these small business owner events, how in the world had I built this unbelievable corporate client list and how was I doing it? Mm -hmm. And um, I actually kept telling people, oh, you know. And they were like, no, Angelique. No, we, no. Yeah, no. No, that <laughs> and makes so, yeah. yeah, and one woman, this is a true story. I was, you know, like in the early days of work from home, you're in your PJs all day, or is that just me? No, it's absolutely like- Yeah, I mean, I hate Zoom, right? I top, really business on the top. You exactly. Know, well, we had no Zoom bottom. then. I mean, there was no Zoom. We didn't have TikTok. We didn't have Instagram. We didn't have go lives on LinkedIn. So I'm in my PJs. It's like three o'clock in the afternoon. It's a cold winter day in Baltimore. And no kidding, this woman shows up knocking on my front door. She was not going to take no for an answer. I was going to show her how to win corporate clients. She ended up being my first client. And I'm so glad that she was persistent because that's how I ended up creating this business. I'm going way back. That would have been late 2007. So we've been doing this for a long time, wow. a long time. And yeah. we have seen so many fads, so, you know, social media trends, so many things come and go. And the way you sell to corporate clients, I mean, sure, we've got some new tools that you can incorporate in, but the psychology, the underlying pieces, like the true strategic foundation of it hasn't changed. So it's been a pretty interesting journey. Yeah, that's fascinating. And and I think you're right. It's how you do things in the online space and selling, you know, B2B, B2C is different than going to corporate because- one, you're probably not necessarily talking to the owner at corporate, right? You're talking- Never, to unless you're talking to all the shareholders of a company, right? Or, right. you know, you're just not talking to the owners unless it's a smaller enterprise of a few hundred. But even then, it's not, it's a very different mindset. It's not like they're paying with their own personal credit card. Right, and that in itself is different. Now, I, I would assume- you know, they're probably not willy nilly with the money either, right? They're, they're very great stewards of it. And they probably got to the positions that they're in because they are stewards of it and they are protecting the company, how, or, you know, the corporation, how it needs to be so on and so forth. But I think the biggest mind shift in my brain is going, 
you were listing all of the people, the image consultant, the copywriter, the muralist, like I, I never actually considered my event production business as somebody that could support corporate. Oh, people like you are in our community at Bold House supporting corporate right now, not just could, they are. And, um, you know, literally I would hire in corporate people who would make clay models of huge things that you can easily show. I'm talking about submarines or what would be called boats in the military space, you know, ships, um, you know, everything from literally muralists coming in, trade show planners, event planners, everything. You know, companies are, I think that one of the big misconceptions about companies is that this fear of like, oh my gosh, I'm working with a company that has hundreds of thousands of employees. But the fact is most departments are actually pretty small at the corporate level. So most you know, departments are gonna have anywhere from five to maybe a few hundred people in IT. If you're talking about a company that has tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of employees, oftentimes those are people out in the field. Those are people in the Walmart stores or they're the folks who are on the manufacturing floors. Not that you can't do training, employee you know, workshops and trainings for those groups, but even then they're going to be broken down into groups of 50, 100 people. So, you know, I think the idea of companies sounds very scary because you're often talking about these huge numbers. But when you're a consultant, a coach, a trainer, a graphic designer, a copywriter, an event planner, fill in the blank, you're dealing with small groups of people that ultimately make up that larger organization. And I think that's probably one of the biggest misconceptions that feels why so many people stay on the sidelines of what is otherwise a very lucrative market. I love that. Um, would you? What would you say are maybe like some mistakes that you see these business owners, consultants, experts <laughs> try like do to win and work with corporate? Like what are the biggest mistakes you see them doing? Well, one is using strategies from the online marketing sort of coachy world over with corporate decision makers. But I'll, I'll, I'll share a different one that's very much more tactical for folks. It's the way that they're thinking about content marketing because somebody somewhere along the line said content is king. Um, and the thing is that in the corporate space with B2B decision makers, and you know, we defined, let me, let me back up for just one quick second. At Bold House, we define corporate. We use corporate as a very big umbrella. So our clients work with small enterprises with several hundred employees. They work with colleges, universities, nonprofits, local, state, federal government, international NGOs, mid-market companies, and the big corporates. We're always just talking about selling to a decision maker who's spending the their employer's money versus their money. So Got that's it. kind of, so just to kind of put that in perspective. But when we're talking about those types of decision makers, there's a couple of things you have to remember about those decision makers. The first is they're spending hardly any time on social media. I'm not saying they're not on social media. I'm just saying that they are in meetings all day long, whether in the office or on Zoom, their calendars are consumed by meetings, consumed by responding to emails, and consumed by actually doing their work. So when they go out to consume content, it's always driven by, I'm looking for something or I need something. The sources that they tend to go to are industry associations, professional associations, trade publications, these known sources that they turn to. And then the third thing is from, so if you're going to put content out, you, you can put it on your own channel as well, but you want to try to leverage these channels of industry associations, professional associations that have podcasts, they have blogs, they have webinars, they have they have all of these channels that decision makers are already going to. They already have your audience. They've already built your audience for you. And they have these communication channels they have to fill with nonstop content and expertise. So that's one thing of like understanding just how do you leverage these other organizations' platforms to get your message to the decision makers, because that's where they spend most of their time. The second piece is the what, the what are you putting out there? And we, it's really interesting. If I speak at a conference, I will often select 
people that I know are in that industry and I will go to their blog articles. I will go to their LinkedIn articles and I'll pull real world titles that they're using. 99% of the content that small business owners put out who are trying to operate in the B2B space are putting out messaging to the doer, to the doer level of how, how do you get, let's say you're a leadership coach, how do you give feedback in an interview or, or to uh, an employee who's not do, performing well? How would you give feedback to that employee? Well, that's doer level messaging, but you want them to buy a strategic solution, ideally a 12 month leadership development program to you. So what you should be talking to decision makers about is decision maker level topics, which is what kind of components should you be including in your 12 month leadership development course, you know, programs and journeys, not how do you give feedback? How do you improve your emotional intelligence? How do you like those things don't lead to engagements with decision makers because you're not talking about engagement level problems. You're talking about an individual level problem. So we see a huge, huge issue around not understanding how to do decision maker talk. How do you, we always say, how do you speak decision maker? We will teach you at Bold House how you speak decision maker. And if you don't know how to speak decision maker and you're just talking to individuals in organizations about hey, how they personally do their job, you're giving great content, but you are not going to land meetings with the decision makers because they won't understand how and what to buy from you. Yeah, that is so good. Like that's a rewind, re-listen to piece right there is who is it you're actually talking to. And I think that's probably also the difference between the online space and speaking to other, you know, coaches who are spending their own money with you exactly. versus, you know, a corporation that's spending somebody else's money and how their brain needs to think about the strategic piece of how do exactly. I do this to like have the implementation to put something in place so my team does learn the content that you're putting in the the do exactly. side, right? It's, yeah. So you've got, you know, you think about every leader inside of an organization, they wear two different hats. They wear the hat of the job right in front of them that, you know, nose to the grind, they're buried in email, they're getting their work done. But then if they're also a senior leader, they're making decisions on behalf of the organization. They're looking out and saying, what do we have to do next year? How are we going to solve this problem? And we have a couple hundred thousand dollars next year to put towards fixing X in our organization. How are we going to go about doing that? And that's the hat that you need to speak to, not the hat of, okay, I've got to send this email to, to a, you know, to an employee who has to step up their game. How should I craft that? That's doer level messaging versus decision maker level messaging. And so that's really, we talk about that at our live event a lot every year because we know we see it, like we're constantly watching the marketplace and I'm seeing what people are putting their time and energy into and it breaks my heart because I know that they're giving it their all and they're doing what they feel everybody is telling them to do. And yet it's not bringing leads in and, you know, we can take one look at it and see, see why that is. Yeah. So if we could touch a little bit on maybe some of the myths, um, I've, yeah. I've either heard it or, you know, somebody's mentioned it or whatever of, it takes so long to get a corporate contract and they make you go through and jump through all these hoops and you have to like give your first born and, you know, in order to get things the way it needs to be to maybe possibly win the contract. Is that true? Or, you know, is that something that you at Bolt House? Sometimes, have? sometimes oh. it's true. Sometimes it's true. We have, you know, and sometimes they call and they need it on Monday. It's Friday okay. and they need it Monday and they're ready to go and you're getting that check. Just like in any other market, we have someone who just enrolled to work with us this year in one of our mastermind programs, and it took her seven years to come into our program. And some of, you know, some folks who work with small business owners will find that they'll have an event or they'll speak at someone else's event or they'll host a webinar or what have you, and someone will be on their list or, you know, um, 
on social media for years and years and years before they work with them. The big difference though, is that first of all, I, well, let me say this. The, the big difference isn't how long it takes because in any market, you could have short sales cycles and long sales cycles. The big difference is that in organizations, you can't create a false sense of urgency. In the small business owner space, you will see all sorts of tactics being used to create a false sense of urgency. You might be on one of those really tacky enrollment sales calls that some companies use. And it's if you sign up now on the call, they're going to take $3,000 off a $20,000 program. Or you will find that there is the doors closed tonight, the doors closed tonight, there's expiring pricing. You know, we certainly have for our event, early bird pricing and just in time pricing. And so, but when it comes to decision makers inside of organizations, you can't control their urgency. They're going to be ready when they're ready. Sometimes yeah. that's Monday, and sometimes that's next quarter. One of the places that that myth comes from, that it takes a long time to sell to corporate, is actually for product purchases. So imagine you're a small firm, a small manufacturing company, and you're going to sell brake pads to Mercedes or BMW. That is going to take you a long time because first of all, they're going to get bids from all sorts of companies and they're going to test your product and they're going to make sure that your company can actually produce as many brake pads as they need and you're not going to ca you know, cause a recall for their organization. But if you're coming in to train 100 leaders on emotional intelligence, or you're being brought in to do branding or experiential marketing for a new hotel location that's opening, that's right now. They need an event or a marketing person to come in now to work with influencers and get those folks to that new location by the beach. You know, they need to move quickly. That is not going through the same type of purchasing process that Target goes through if they're thinking about putting new products in their home section of Target. So a lot of those myths come from the product industry and companies that have to make sure that when they're buying thousands tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of units of that product that it's going to be delivered on time and meet their quality expectations. It is very different when you're a leadership coach going in or a keynote speaker going in. It's just not the same process. And a lot of times it doesn't even go through purchasing or procurement. The decision makers have budget depending on the size of the organization, and they're making that decision out of their own budget. So it's a very different process unless you're in the product space. That that's clears it up without a doubt. And that I could see on the product side taking longer. Oh, I'm gonna get multiple it's miserable. Points. It's miserable on the product side. Yeah. And I admit that it's miserable on the product side, but on the expert niche services, it's not. I, I'll if it's okay, there's one other myth that comes up. Yeah. And we were just celebrating, we call them champagne moments in our community. And we were just celebrating several champagne moments. A lot of small business owners don't think that they can can compete with the bigger providers. And in fact, we just got back from one of our mastermind retreats and three separate people stood up to share that they beat out much, much bigger companies, names that most people listening to this would actually recognize those brand names. And our Bold House Playmakers were able to beat those larger competitors. And there's a really simple reason for that. A lot of these bigger companies, the way that they're so big is that they have a lot of junior staffers. They have to hire a lot of people and a lot of junior staffers, and they have a lot of overhead. And so you'll have a fancy schmancy sales team come in and sell the sun, the moon, and the stars, but then all these junior staffers show up and they follow a playbook. It's like a recipe. And they, everything is cookie cutter and everything has to fit into this very rigid process, whether or not the client is getting what they need or not. And they're paying a lot of overhead for this, right? It's a total science project because you have rungs and rungs and rungs of consultants and team members running around doing all of this stuff. So big bill, 
mediocre results in a lot of cases. So a lot of times our clients come in and they're, they're the expert and they've got a team, a hand, maybe a couple of people, maybe nobody, maybe they have a couple of what we call bench members that are other small business owners that are going to partner with them on the opportunity. And they're going to go in and these are people with like 15, 20, 25 years, you know, these are people who've been around and they're going to work directly with a client and they're going to give them a complete custom solution. And there's no overhead. They don't have a fancy 25 story corporate building to pay for. They're working from their home office. So really the client is just getting pure expertise. That's what they're paying for. And we see it all the time that the bigger competitors will lose to our clients because our clients can give them white glove, customized, totally bespoke solutions and really work and, and have that personal relationship with them that a big company just can't replicate. That's so very true. My So my fiance works in a big, huge corporation mm -hmm. and you know they bring in some of these like leadership things and they're training on these things and I'm like listening to what they've taken him through and I'm like how I'm sorry how how much did you all pay for that it, exact they it so they're gonna over they're gonna get overcharged yeah and a lot of those big vendors those big service providers are gonna under deliver it's going to be very very cookie cutter yeah. And you're going to get a lot of junior staffers and it yeah. happens all the time. So we see it. I mean, we have for, you know, we've been doing this a long time, 16, almost 17 years now. And we watch it over and over again, where you will see not for everything, you know, look, if you're a major corporation, if you're Coca-Cola and you're about to implement an enterprise wide IT system. Mm -hmm. You need a company like Accenture to come in there and do that. Yeah. But if you are a business unit or a department and you're looking to do, to up level leaders or have an amazing uh, voice of the customer event for your clients, you don't need to do that. You need the boutique firms. And so here's one other thing, and then I know we can move on, but I think this is really cool. And that is the life cycle of the employee has changed. The life cycle of the employee has changed. And now the best employees leave to go start their own firms. They end up in our room at Bold House. And the way that organizations are able to tap into all of that knowledge of the best people that were formerly the, in corporate who became the corporate escapees is by going to the boutique firms and that, and so when you look at the life cycle of the employee today, it's very different. And so that brain drain can be recovered when these decision makers go to the boutique firms. And then we make sure those boutique firms, those business owners, those self-employed experts and those founders of those boutique firms know how to show up at the table and be just as well prepared, if not frankly, better prepared than the larger competitors who have those very icky sales strategies that decision makers hate. And so we know those decision makers hate those approaches. And so when our team, when our bold house change agents are out there meeting with decision makers, the decision makers are like, this has been the most amazing meeting that I have had in a really long time. And every time I hear that, I'm like, exactly. That's why we started this company. You're like, because I was there. I was on that's that why. side of the table. That's and right. I I've been there change. and we don't I mean, do it. So that's why. And so that's, so it's amazing. So I think there are a lot of myths. It's really interesting. I feel like that's what I've somewhat spent my last, you know, 15 to 17 years trying to bust through those myths. Um, but they persist and I understand why. And there's, there's always a grain of truth in everything. But again, a lot of times when you really look at the whole picture, it's like, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense why certain things would take a long time. And for some companies, they're not ready and you can't make them ready, but when they're ready, they're ready and you yeah. bet, and you better be ready. Yeah. And you better yeah. be like, like you were saying in those publications and where their eyeballs are going. That's right for them to show up. Now, do they actually get on your email list and things of that nature? Um, you know, will they stay with you or? Yeah, decision makers will. They certainly okay. will get on email lists. I think LinkedIn newsletters have provided something that's really phenomenal, honestly. That's like my favorite thing now um, because email deliverability is in the gutter with email deliverability and it's just a pain. Um, and you've got such a built-in audience on LinkedIn and then other people can easily share. So I'm much more a fan of that. Um, but we do teach our clients 
clients at Bold House how to create virtual platforms to leverage and to create though that engagement. You know, it is not about visibility in the B2B space, in the corporate space. It's about engagement. You actually need to spend time with decision makers. So visibility does not really do anything. Um, you know, a decision maker isn't like, oh my gosh, I love your reels. I, you know, it's not, that's not it. It's They need to spend time with you. And while you're spending that time, you need to help them shape how they're thinking about the problems in their organization and how they're going to solve those problems. And that takes time. So, you know, for us, it is about spending actual time engaging with decision makers. And a lot of that it, are micro events. A lot of that are things like, you know, executive forums and in-person events and virtual webinars and, you know, those kinds of activities where you can really, really engage with decision makers. Um, you know, it takes about seven hours of time that you need to spend with a decision maker until they kind of come into your fold as being part of your network. So you think about, oh, a lot of my business comes through word of mouth. Well, that's great, but you need to then constantly be expanding your network so you can have more word of mouth. And for someone to really feel like they're in your network and for you to feel like they're in your network, you need to spend about seven hours, not one-on-one. -on -one. It can be in things like webinars, but they need to spend time with you. Mm -hmm. and get comfortable and feel like they kind of know who you are and what your firm is all about. Yeah. So uh, every time, like you've, you've mentioned the word events in our time here a number of times, and I know you do crazy awesome events and like, would you say that that and maybe something else or, or is events one of the things that have allowed you to one gain corporate clients to grow in scale, you know, is that something, or is it a combination of events plus something that's allowed you to grow your business the way you have? Yeah. I mean, I, I would say hands down events, events, events. Um, but they aren't always my events. I also leverage other people's events and they can be virtual or IRL. They don't have to always be in person, but I believe without a doubt that engagement is king, queen, whatever you want to call it. Um, engagement, you know, rules the day. And so we sponsor events. I buy speaking left, right, and center. I know some people are convinced they should only ever be paid uh, for speaking, but there are five different types of speaking that you can use. And in my opinion, that you should use. And one of the, one of the types of speaking is keynotes where you get paid for that. But another type of speaking is where you're doing a business development talk. And that's what we teach our clients how to do. You, which is actually structure a talk that acquires corporate decision makers. And that's a very different type of talk than say a speak to sell or a workshop or a paid keynote. Those are all very different types of talks that you can give. And I will pay for an opportunity to speak on someone else's platform in a heartbeat if they have done the work to build that audience, which takes years and 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 years to build that audience and build the trust and build the rapport and then put their money at risk to put on the event, right? Because with everything, there's a risk. Look at what happened pre-pandemic, right? That was, we all, every day in business, you have risks that you're balancing. But if someone else is going to put on an event and create the audience and all the money and time and years and blood, sweat and tears to build that audience, and they're going to handle all the logistics and they're going to handle the risk of that event. And I get to make a small investment and show up and speak at their event sign me up in a heartbeat. In fact, just yesterday, an organization that I reached out to a year and a half ago, and I said, if you do this event, I would like to speak at your event. And if I have to buy a sponsorship to do it, and they're like, oh, we're not sure. Yesterday, they're like, you know what? Let's talk. We're ready to go. We will, If you're willing to sponsor, you can have a spot. So I speak at a lot of events. Um, people, if they spend time with me, I'm not really so good at um, say it dancing on TikTok or doing those silly trends. I'm not very good at lip syncing to the latest, whatever the thing is. Like, I just don't get it. I'm really clumsy and awkward. But if I can spend 
45 minutes with a live audience, I the people in the room who sell to corporate or who want to sell to corporate understand in that time who I am, what I'm about, and that we're the real deal. Mm -hmm. And so I will, so, so events have been without question. So if you ever have folks in your audience who are like, should I sponsor? The answer is yes. If your audience is in the room, sponsor the event because you're going to pay with everything through either money or time. And money is the cheapest way to pay for anything. Money is the cheapest way to pay for anything. So that's number one. And then number two are my own events, um, are really my own events. And, um, you know, we have a lot of clients at Bold House who do put on events for, say, women leaders inside of corporate. And they might be more, in those tend to be more intimate events. Um, they take advantage of events, big industry conferences that could have tens of thousands of people. And then we have our own events that we do, which is really where we get to spend time with small business owners. And that is for us, our, those experiences are our biggest differentiator because people come in and they've been to so many events before and they think, well, I want to go, but I know I'm not going to learn that much because it's going to be a lot, you know, basically it's, a, you know, they're going to sell me something and I'm not going to get a lot, you know, in this event. And so for us, it's a great way for us to differentiate because we get like, we just teach for three straight days and folks realize how much more there is and they want to stay with us. Um, they're like, I don't want this to end. Like Angelique, just there's just more and more. So I think events are your greatest way to differentiate. I really do. I think when people can spend that time with you, they will get to understand what you're all about. They'll never learn that from a sales letter page. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not going to learn that. So for me, events, and, and like I said, we teach our clients that as well. A lot of virtual experiences um, that they use with corporate clients as well. But yeah, I, I just don't know in today's world when you have AI creating, some guy on YouTube the other day was bragging that he used AI to create 800 articles in 24 hours. Wow. And I just thought to myself, there's not a decision maker or small business owner alive who has time to read 800 articles. <laughs> And, you know, you'll never out content marketing the rest of the world. You'll never out content marketing. You can't win that game. That's not a game you can win. Mm -hmm. But if you can put your audience, your target market in a room for a day or two days or three days, whether in person or virtually, you can put your target market where you own the mind share of that room for one to three days you can win the game. Like you can win the game in that you've got that mind share. And um, so, yeah, it's like location, location, location in real estate. I think in the small business owner space, you've got to understand that you can't compete the same way that a company that has a billion dollars can compete. So the, the rule is events, events, events. Yeah. And I mean, I wholeheartedly agree as well. And you don't need gazillions of people. Right. People are like, oh, I have to do these 4,000 person size event to make it. Pro no. I mean, you know, you can do a 20 person event and make six figures. <laughs> right. Yeah. And yeah. I did. I mean, that was my first event, actually. My, well, the very first time I went out and spoke, it's really funny. I spoke at this. Um, I was so nervous. I hadn't spoken on winning corporate clients and I was so scared. Um, and I apply, I reached out to, 50 plus organizations in the Baltimore area and only one got back to me. And she was a, she was a woman's business coach and she owned a dream dinners. So before there were things like, um, oh my gosh, hello fresh and those subscription boxes to your house with the dinners, dream dinners was a place that you would go to. It was a franchise and you'd go into a dream dinners and you would do your meal prep. And it was always located in a strip mall. And so I went to this dream dinners in a strip mall and six people showed up, two of which were Avon reps and two of which were Tupperware reps. And I'm in the park. I'm so scared. I'm puking in the parking lot before I go in because I'm so terrified to speak to this group. So ridiculous. I mean, looking back, I'm like, I wish I could just give me 16 years ago a hug because I was so terrified. Um, 
But, you know, my first event that I ever did had 20 people, it may be 18. It was in a little hotel in Baltimore, a Hotel Monaco, which are fabulous. Um, and it was a Hotel Monaco and I had 18 people. I didn't have any AV. I had a flip chart and I had workbooks and I had one director's chair because I thought you had to have a director's chair because that's what I saw everybody do. <laughs> so I bought my director's chair because... How can you do an event without a director's chair? For sure. <laughs> so I had I had my flip chart. I had my workbooks that were printed it. Um, that then it was Kinko's, mm -hmm. and um, I had my director's chair, and that was my event. It was two days, and I think we charged like I don't know one ninety seven for it, if I'm guessing. Um, but we did six figures out of it, and I sold a mastermind that had like twelve people in it, not all from the room, about half from the room. Nice. And then half that I, you know, sold off my then easing, which for those of you who are newer to the industry, you'll be like, what is this woman talking about? Um, but that's how I sold my first. And then my next event had about 60. Um, and actually that was in the middle of a hurricane. Oh, wow. So that was kind of interesting. And then my next event was 450. So Wow, that's amazing. Even during a hurricane, right? So you think that people are going, oh, they're not going to show up because of a hurricane. But whatever it is you were teaching in the moment, their pain was great enough to go, I have to figure this out. And if she well, some solution, didn't. Yeah. You know? So it was really interesting. So actually, um, we had um, we had about 60 people register. Maybe it was 65, 70. Um, and uh, it was Hurricane Sandy. And most of all, I had spoken numerous times in New York. So we had a lot of people coming from the New York, New Jersey area. The event was in Washington, D.C. Really, it was technically in Tyson's Corner. And um, we got a lot of cancellations. We got about 20 cancellations at the last minute because people's homes had flooded and roads had flooded. One woman in particular, though, I'll never forget, she took the Greyhound bus because she wanted to be at our event. And even though her house had 10 feet of water in it, she thought, well, there's nothing I can do about it until the water starts to recede. So I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to take the Greyhound bus into Angelique's event. And that's what she did. But here's what we ended up doing. I'm, I, you know, look, I came out of corporate. I came out, part of my job was always crisis communications. So I actually do really well in a crisis. And what we ended up doing is we sent out emails to our list for everyone across Washington, D.C., Northern Virginia, Baltimore, sort of the surrounding area. And we said, look, here's the deal. We've had, you know, 15, 20 people cancel because of the hurricane. And these people are in a world of trouble because for those in the United States listening to this, Hurricane Sandy was a pretty big deal in places like New York and New Jersey. They got hit really hard. And I and and actually this event was a lot more than the first event. This event was either 695 or 795, something in that range. Yeah. And I said, here's the deal. If you make a donation right now to the American Red Cross for at least $500 and you then send that receipt to me, you can come to this event and take one of their seats. And we ended up raising about $6,000 for the American Red Cross. And we ended up having about 12 people take those, I don't know, it was like 18 to 20 seats that got kind of lost to the situation. Yeah. But we ended up picking up another 12 and we raised money for the American Red Cross specifically for their fund for Hurricane Sandy. And some of those people ended up enrolling in our mastermind and becoming clients of ours for years and years. And we felt really good about the fact that the materials we had printed and the food we had paid for at the hotel and the rooms that were part of the room block were all utilized instead of going to waste. Yeah. And um, it ended up being just, it was, you know, obviously horrendous. Uh, it doesn't make up for what people experienced during that hurricane, of course. But it was a really beautiful moment to look at it and say, how can we make the most of what's happening right now and serve the most people? And it, that's what we did. That's amazing. And it just goes to show the power of events when you end up bringing a group of people together with an intention in mind to create change in the world. And, you know, that's why I love events. That's why I love like having give back offers. We've had one where they ended up raising enough money to pull out nine Golden Gate bridges full of trash out of the ocean. 
That's you incredible. Know? Like just amazing things you can do when you get a group of people together on top of everything else they're learning about from you, right? Absolutely. So, super power. We could go on and on and on and talk forever, but I would love for you to kind of share a little bit more on, you know, if people have questions, they want to learn more about the insights of landing corporate clients, like where do they go? What resources do they have with you? How do they best connect with you and Bolt House? Oh, I love it. Well, there's only two Angelique Rewers is on the planet, but one was through marriage. So there's the original here. So you'll just find me on LinkedIn, the only Angelique Rewers on LinkedIn. So please do connect with me there. If you head over to our website, and I know you're going to share the link to this, but if you head to boldhouse.com, we have a fantastic quick start guide for really what it takes to build a million dollar plus boutique professional services company, whether that's coaching, training, keynote speaking, some type of services like event planning, graphic design, copywriting, whatever it is. Essentially, if you're selling expertise or services, there's an amazing quick start guide there for you that really shifts how you're probably thinking about growing your business. And then lastly, I'm very active over on Instagram, which is just the Angelique Rewers uh, account, which you can find very easily there as well. Um, so those would be three fantastic ways to connect with me. Perfect. Yeah. So we will have the link in the show notes. And if you can get to one of Angelique's um, events that are coming up, highly recommend them. They are always top-notch first class and you walk away with so much like actionable things to do. Uh, she's one of the greatest in the industry. My last question for you, my dear, is what is a takeaway or memorable note you'd like to leave our audience with? However you work with organizations, they are a force multiplier to your business. They have budget, they have influence, they have reach. There are many, many ways to work with organizations, whether they are your clients or your stages or your strategic alliances. So please don't discount them or take yourself out of that game because as a small business owner, you need leverage. And that's what organizations are to your business. They are that force multiplier that you need. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you so much for being with us. And I want to thank our audience for joining us on another episode of Creating Powerful Impact I am stoked for you to take all of these lessons, these resources you've learned here today, start implementing them and create even more impact in your world. Until next time, have an outstanding rest of your day. Take care. Thank you so much for listening to the Creating Powerful Impact podcast. If you are a successful coach, speaker, author, or thought leader who would like to be on this program, Simply visit creatingpowerfulimpact.com forward slash guest. If you are someone who got something out of this interview, would you please do me a favor and share this episode on social media? Just do a quick screenshot with your phone and text it to a friend or post it on your socials. Also, if you know somebody that would be a great guest, tag them on social media to let them know about the show and include the hashtag creating powerful impact. I love seeing all of your posts and great guest selections. We are regularly putting out new episodes and content to make sure you don't miss any episodes. Go ahead and subscribe. Your thumbs up ratings and reviews go a long way to help promote the show. And they really mean a lot to me and my team. Want to know more about us? Head on over to our website, graceandeaseproductions.com or follow me on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Instagram. Just look for Grace and Ease Productions on your favorite platform. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.